Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Mike Bubb. He's going to tell the behind-the-scenes story of when Steve Earle and Del McCurry got together to make the classic album, The Mountain. Uh, the Mountain came about, uh, it, was, uh, it was actually Steve Earle's idea. And uh, around 19, I want to say 99, 98, somewhere in there, you know, Steve had been through a lot in his career, in his life. He was having, he, he, I think he'd li been living in a ha halfway house. And um, he'd gotten over his drug issues that he had had, he was sober. And he eventually w made his way back here to Nashville. There used to be a magazine, I think it's online now, called No Depression. And they used to do these nights at the Station Inn where they would bring two artists together to do separate set and then one together collaborate on a show so it would always be some roots oriented uh, artist and uh, when Steve came back to Nashville he was everywhere and he became really prolific as a songwriter all of a sudden all these songs were just coming out of him like crazy he produced a band called the V-Roys which is a band that was out of Knoxville and he had us on a song of theirs we did a session for them and so we sort of established a little bit of a rapport with him I mentioned earlier that the record that Dell made before I joined the band, called Blue Side of Town, has a Steve Earle song on it. And when they were recording that song, it needed a second verse. It was too short. So Ken Irwin found Steve Earle wherever he was at and said, can you write another verse? We're in the studio. Can you make another verse up for this song that Del McCurry is recording? Next thing you know, over the facts came this, you know, a verse that Steve had just written out for it and that was their so their first connection was through that song getting that uh, recording made and Steve writing that verse for that song so anyway we got together with Steve and the first album that Steve made uh, when he came back to Nashville and uh, was a, a record called um, Train It Coming with Norman Blake Peter Rowan and Roy Husky Jr. It's my favorite Steve Earle album. It's a great album, and it's kind of obscure these days, but it's a really, there's, there's some amazing songs on there that Steve wrote. And so we ended up working up a bunch of those songs off that record to collaborate with Steve at this No Depression show at uh, Station Inn. <laughs> anyway, we worked up all those songs from that record, and, uh, and then we, we, we did the collaboration. And that night afterward, we're in the in the back room of the station in, and Steve Earle says, Dale, I'm gonna write a, I'm gonna write a whole bluegrass album and I want you guys to play and sing on it. Back me up on it. I'm gonna write a whole album. And of course Dell's like, Hey, that sounds good, Steve. You know, give us a call. And uh, you know, little did we know how uh, how quick this was gonna happen. Cause like I I mean a couple of months later, we now we're in the studio with him, and he'd written most of the record, like in a couple of weeks. Part of what Steve did was, when I mentioned that we had this Tuesday night band, the Sidemen, uh, Steve came every week for about three months. Every Tuesday night, he would come down there, and uh, we'd get him up on the second set, and he would do a little set of his tunes, or, or Bluegrass, Stanley Brothers, whatever he knew or was learning at the time. And uh, he would just sit in with us and just get his guitar chops, his bluegrass chops together, just sort of get a feel for the music and get an inspiration for these songs that he was writing. But he came every week, almost religiously. Next thing you know, we're in the studio recording at Ray Kennedy's studio, which was uh, right there on Music Row. And uh, that was an experience that, unlike any we'd ever experienced, you know, mostly we'd made records uh, with isolation and we, we didn't do... A lot of overdubs, we tried to get a live track as much as we could, but we would overdub harmonies and we would overdub, you know, breaks if they needed or whatever needed fixing. In Steve's recording situation, we lined up in a straight line and he was facing us. There was no baffles. There was no isolation of any kind. It was just we were all in a room together. And um, one of the other things that they don't didn't use was reverb. Everything was highly compressed, like a rock album. So it, I always describe it as a five-piece band coming through a garden hose, you know, just like, it's just so intense. And, and uh, uh, it, we had never heard anything like that in our bluegrass world. It was a real eye-opener and sort of a learning situation. And it wasn't easy to accept it because, it, you know, we were so used to this other way of 
the sound, you know, they would listen to playbacks incredibly loud, you know, just crank the studio control room to 100 dB, you know, it was just like, I think it's because they enjoyed it. It wasn't because they were trying to he listen for anything particular. It's just like, that's the way they like to listen to music. And when you record that way, uh, you can crank it up and it has another effect on the music, the way you hear it, you know, when it's just compressed and not, uh, doesn't have any reverb that opens it up, you know. And uh, so that was a big learning curve to, to get used to that, you know, that recording style. And uh, if you listen to the very front of that record, it's like because the way we were set up, headphones are kind of optional. You didn't really have to have headphones, but I was wearing headphones. And uh, at the very beginning of the record, you can hear Steve. He says, uh, M-I-C-K-E-Y. You got to have your hat on if you're going to play in the band, son, or something like that. Well, that was me putting my headphones on. And he's talking to me on there. And then we start with Texas Eagle, which had the uh, slap bass on it, you know. And uh, so then, uh, you know, the next thing you know, we, we made this record. And I had never been paid so much for a record, ever. He paid us, uh, he paid us double scale, double master scale. And we must have been in the studio for, I want to say, five days making that record. So two sessions a day, uh, double pay, you know. I was like, I'd never seen anything like that, you know. It was, it was incredible, you know, incredibly generous on his part. But, you know, I think they wanted to treat the bluegrassers, sh show the bluegrass guys, you know, how it can be out there, I guess, you know. So the record gets done, and uh, the first gig that we're going to play is Farm Aid in Chicago. And this big outdoor a Tinley Park. It's an outdoor, what they call a shed. You know, it's a, sort of a semi-indoor, outdoor amphitheater. Big old place. And um, we go there. We we show up. We're in Dell's bus. We came from somewhere. We had to play a gig afterward that night, I think. After we played Farm Aid, we played another show in, in, the, in the Chicago area. So we were there, traveled separately in Dell's bus. And I just remember being in the parking lot behind the stage and uh, Neil Young had this incredible bus that looks like a looks like a, a, a train locomotive. You know, the metal <laughs> chrome goes all the way up to the top, and at the top he had a couple of mercury coops up there for observation towers in the top of the bus. And um, he had a son, I think, that had cerebral palsy or something like that. And uh, he would he had a like an automated automatic wheelchair that would come out, and they had a crane that would come out and lift him out of the bus and onto the ground. And, and uh, it was pretty cool to see all that. Um, and Neil Young's got all kinds of cool custom vehicles that he's had made over the years. Uh, we also met the guys from Fish at that thing. And they were all standing outside of Dell's bus going, that's Del McCurry's bus, you know. And Ronnie recognized them and came out. We met them and talked to them and stuff. So that was kind of cool. But the really cool thing was when, before we played, we're backstage in this big, it's almost like a warehouse, like an aircraft hangar, which is behind the stage. There's all these people standing around, all these rock guys, you know. And we're, we're the only people that have acoustic instruments at this thing. Everybody else is playing electric guitars and stuff. So mostly everybody's just standing, milling around back there. Well, we break out the instruments and start playing. The next thing you know, we got this huge crowd around us backstage. And it's everybody's back there. I just remember uh, Steve Earle's manager talking to... Uh, uh, Paul from the tonight from a Letterman show. Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer was there, and he's like, "Man, this is amazing! This is incredible!" You know, we just sit right there in the middle of it. You know, those guys they never seen anything like that before. You know, and uh, especially bluegrass at that high level like that. You know, it's really it's it's something to see and hear for the first time. And uh, anyway, I remember his manager telling Paul, you know, hey. I said, when this, he says, when this record comes out, we're going to need some help getting on the show. So remember us and, and put in a good word for us when it comes around. And so you eventually we did Letterman and that was a whole nother drama within itself. But, uh, uh, well, <laughs> we, we went on tour with Steve, you know, the whole thing, Steve had a way of doing business with his band and he was just going to carry this over to this tour. And at the time, Dell had just got a manager, uh, at the, by the time we were making this record. So I think he, you know, he wanted to uh, show out a little bit of his capabilities as a manager. So he went into the other Steve's manager's office, tried to hash some things out. I don't think it went too well. 
Because basically, you know, Steve Earle, it was a gift. The whole thing was a gift in a way, the way they were paying us to do the sessions. And then, you know, we're going to go play all these sold out rooms around the country that were, I mean, this was one of the biggest things to happen in Roots Music, I think, at that couple of years right there. It was news. It was a big news thing. There were some issues about this. The record uh, got nominated for a Grammy and they pulled it out of the bluegrass category, I think, and put it in the country category or maybe it was vice versa because it was getting airplay actually on commercial radio. And we got nominated for a Grammy, but we lost to Ricky Skaggs that year. I think is what it was. I think we, I think they had it in the country category, and then it wound up in the bluegrass category. Some there was some kind of issue there with the uh, Naris over that. But um, so we went on. We the, we embarked on this tour, and and the thing was is that Steve was going to pay us all a weekly wage, which was going to be X amount of dollars plus per diem, and you get your own hotel room every night, and he'd cover all the expenses of the bus and everything else. Well, that didn't sit well with the McCurry side because even though Jason and I would be making more money than we were getting with Dell, the boys would be making less. And so that was kind of an issue. So they had to figure out how to sort this out. So what they ended up doing was just paying Dell a certain amount every night. And then he, we got paid through Dell, our regular daily pay. And, uh, and that's the way that went, which was, you know, it was no big deal, really, for me, but but it was for them because it just changed the dynamic, you know, the financial dynamic here and there. So they wanted to sort of keep it the same, and that's what they ended up doing. And uh, but we went and played, uh, you know, these fantastic theaters, and I mean, you know, uh, we went down to Texas and played all over down there, and and we did a whole Northeast run. No, we did a show in uh, Sweden that was on the radio, and that might be what you've heard. It was in Malmo, Sweden, and Steve kept saying, the line dancers will be out. There's all these you know, country music line dancers in Sweden. They love the line dancing. And sure enough, you know, we start playing. They're, they're out there doing their line dance. And that, that tape's been around, the Malmo tape, um, and it was all on really good microphones and stuff. And we also played down in Germany, uh, they lost our microphones uh, in, a, in transit somewhere. And so they used all these Telefunkens and Neumann microphones and stuff. We had a great sound guy with us. And uh, he'd actually made a little stereo microphone to go on the vocal mic. So we just did one microphone with Steve. That's what he wanted to do. It was old school. He went out and bought like four, you know, Armani suits. And uh, he did it right, man. He was just like suited up, played on one microphone and, First night we played was in uh, Louisville at, uh, uh, what's that place up there? Anyway, Louisville's a whiskey town. People get rowdy up there. So Steve, you know, the sound on one microphone with no monitors, you know, this is a guy who's rocked his entire life, you know, so all of a sudden he can't hear anything, you know. It's just not enough for him, especially in a club. Headliners is the name of the place. So he just gets right in on this microphone, you know, and all of the, whatever moisture that's coming onto that microphone starts shorting it out, you know. <laughs> so he had a custom mic made by uh, CAD, Kanio uh, Audio Devices up in uh, Ohio, and they made one with a, with a screen on the inside of it so that uh, if he got too close to it, it wouldn't, wouldn't distort. So we did that month-long tour, and um, when we got done with that tour, I just remember that Dell had some kind of back problems and he could barely stand up straight. And that was when they were putting together the music for Oh Brother, Why Art Thou? They called Dell to come down. They had like a cattle call for all these different artists to come down and record these traditional songs. And they were going to pull artists and songs from this sort of audition, couple of audition days they had down there. Well, he could never make it because he had to go see a chiropractor and he was in such pain in his back. So he never, never made it down there. And we, we didn't have anything to do with the Oh Brother, Why Art Thou soundtrack. We could have if, if it had all worked out right, but um, didn't. But eventually we did do the summer tour with the, the big traveling tent show that they did. But uh, anyway, so then, um, you know, we had about a couple of weeks off. We started playing dates with the Del McCurry band, doing our own bluegrass festivals and stuff in between the next big thing, which was to go to Europe. But prior to going to Europe, we had to do all these TV shows. 
to promote the album. And see, Steve had been on all these shows, so it was easy for him to get booked on them. You know, we would have never gotten on them on our own without him. So the Letterman show came up, and um, we had a show somewhere with Steve. Oh yeah, we played at Merle Fest. We had our own show. Steve had his own show, but we did one show together. It was only 60 minutes, so we only had so much time. Now, Steve's show with us was three and a half hours long. We would do, we would start with Steve. He would bring Dell out, and we'd do something, and then he would leave, and we would do 30 minutes. Then there would be an intermission, and then Steve would come back out solo, and then we would come back out and finish out the show. And sometimes Iris Dement would be there, or some other, you know, guest artist would come out and sing with us. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we got through the that first tour and then a couple other gigs. And then uh, we played at Merle Fest. And so the set list is like this piece of paper. It's like this. It's like two legal legal papers put together, 28 inches long. So Steve goes through. He just starts marking off all the songs that we're not going to do. And so I took that over to Dell's bus. And I said, here's the set for tonight of the stuff that Steve wants to do. And all Dell could see was that all the songs that he performed were scratched out. Where, you know, he had sort of a bad reaction to that. Really all it was was Steve was condensing what we did down to 60 minutes and mostly making it the record and a few other things, which was what the, what the show was supposed to be. So that just kind of irked Dell, I think, a little bit, where he, he just sort of saw that he was being marginalized and all in this but we all both had our own shows so it wasn't like we weren't going to get to play for the people you know our own stuff so that happens then we come back to nashville and we did this uh, street festival down uh uh right down on uh first avenue it was all up and down the river down there and again another show where we just had limited time and uh so and we were flying out that afternoon to go play a bluegrass festival so, so we're down there, and of course, we all drive down, and Steve's got a bus down there. So we changed clothes in this dressing room they had for us. We did the show, but Steve saw Emmy Lou Harris standing out in the crowd. So he gets Emmy Lou up on stage. Well, that just eliminated any chance for the Del McCurry band to get even 10 minutes or five minutes of songs in on our own, you know. And that just irked, you know everybody so we get off the thing and and uh it's a the it's gay street which is like the little connector street there that connects to first avenue and um by the by the courthouse and so to get down there you have to drive around the courthouse and down behind the stage and it's real crowded down there it was all these cars and i think they had the dirty dozen brass band coming in behind us and so steve's manager said hey guys you're making the organization look bad we got to get these cars out of here and moved and we got to do this and that and it just it just rubbed Dell the wrong way, and he just had had it. And he just finally told me, he says, I'm off this tour. I'm done. So you get somebody else. So we went to the airport. By the time I get to the airport, there's Steve's manager out there, and he's got Dell and the boys, and they're all sitting down at these couches, and he's just trying to scotch tape this thing back together. And he's like, hey, you know, we got a whole Europe tour and, a, and these TV shows, and you can't just you can't just walk away from that, you know. And uh, it got a little heated. It got, you know. Anyway, after that, we went on our trip and came back. And, and was, then, was this in public at b and Yes. Yeah. Like <laughs> when walking by? Well. Yeah. Well, kind of. You know, when you go back then, when you went in to where the, um, where the airline ticket uh, desks are, there used to be some little sitting lounges here and there where you could sit, uh, you know, and that's where they were. Uh, we hadn't gone through security or anything. Of course, this was probably pre-9-11, so there was no security back then, hardly. We had to go. I don't know that anything was resolved. It was really the, a business thing. It, was, it had nothing to do with me. I didn't have anything to do with it, you know. Um, I was just along for the ride. So when we get back, and we don't know what's happening, and slowly but surely, Ronnie uh, sort of kissinger things back together because we didn't want to lose the the uh, the Letterman show that's a big lick for a bluegrass band you know again on national television and uh, we also had Conan O'Brien added to that too so we were going to do both shows it comes back around that uh, we're going to we're going to go to Europe and we're going to do this these TV things all right great you know 
So the the Letterman show turns out uh, was an all Nashville show, and the crowd was entirely from Nashville. And I don't know why they dreamed this thing up, but the, the, they had a thing where you could win a free trip to the Letterman show in Nashville. And they chartered a whole jet full of people to take up there. And we knew a couple of people that were there. Uh, Mike and Susan Drudge, he's a booking agent here in, in town. And, and uh, they had actually won free tickets. We saw them in the line as we were going in to do our sound check. You know, the Letterman show is, uh, like all these TV shows, the musicians do their sound check first. You do that in the morning, like at, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. They do all the cameras and, the, and all that stuff. And at the time, we were doing the song Nashville Cats, which was kind of a big hit for, for Dell. Since we found out it was a Nashville show, we got to do Nashville Cats. And then part of the negotiation was that we would do part of Dell's uh, song and part of Steve's song and sort of conjoin the two together so that David Letterman would hold these two albums up. And it would be the Steve Earle, the Mountain, and Del McCurry band album promoted at the same time. That was the big thing. So we got it all worked out. And then we have like a half a day, you know, like four hours to go, you know, kill time until the actual taping of the show. And while that's going on, that's when the band and the, uh, David Letterman, they run through their scripts and all their stuff, the, the pre-show prep that they do for their show. So we come back, and now it's showtime. Now, interesting things about uh, Letterman, as you might have heard this before, is it's really cold in there. It's like 45 degrees they keep it. Nobody sweats at the David Letterman show. And uh, there's nobody running around putting powder on your forehead because <laughs> you're getting glossy, you know. It's cold in there. And uh, Kelsey Grammer was on the show with us. He was the guest. So we kind of were in the green room with Kelsey Grammer for a while. It was kind of cool. And uh, they had a Nashville Predator read the top 10 list. And uh, they had uh, Biff uh, took a tour of Nashville on a flatbed truck with BR549. They roamed all around Nashville. And that was a clip that they played. And, uh, and then they had the Nashville Quiz. And when they did Nashville Quiz, they did, instead of Nashville Cats, they went, Nashville Quiz. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of cool. But they didn't know, the band didn't know that we were going to do Nashville Cats. They, hadn't even been, they weren't even there when we did our thing. And uh, so the sh now it comes around to us, you know. So we do the thing and it goes over great. And Paul cannot believe, Paul Schaefer cannot believe that we did Nashville Cats. He was just like floored, you know. Like, he didn't even expect it or see it coming, you know. He thought they had thought it up, you know. Well, he had already been doing it for, for you know, two years or whatever. Anyway, that was the big big Letterman show. And then afterward, of course, he came over and said hello to everybody. And then he's gone out the door. You never really have any interaction with him at all. He would just show up, do the show, and walk out the door. Probably got in a limousine and left, you know, whenever, where, wherever he lived. But, yeah, I think he dug it. He dug it. And, and a funny thing happened, uh, a about a year later, uh, a buddy of mine named Ernie Sykes, who's a bass player, was playing with Mandy Barnett at the time, and uh, they played on Letterman. And so at the end, no, this is right before we went, actually, he was there beforehand. And uh, he told me that uh, after they got done playing, and Hal Rugg was playing Steel, legendary Steel player, he said when David Letterman came over to say goodnight, you know, while the credits are rolling, Ernie grabs his hand. He says, hey, David, I just want to tell you, I really enjoyed your work with Andy Kaufman. And he goes, well, thank you. Thank you. That's really, really nice of you. I appreciate you saying that. And Andy was a good friend. And that was the end of their little dialogue. And then Hal Rudd goes, I cannot believe you just germed David Letterman. But it was cool, man. You had something to say to him. That was cool. So I told Ernie, I said, hey, tell me exactly what you said to him. And I'm going to say the same thing to him and see what he says. We sort of have the same build. We both played blonde K basses at the time. So we're on the show. At the end, here comes David Letterman. I'm just getting ready to say, I loved your work with Andy Kaufman. And he says, you've been here before? And I go, no, but I'm just going to. And then he was gone. That was it. <laughs> so my brush with David Letterman. And then we did uh, Conan O'Brien. And that was fun, too, because uh, uh, I think I think Steve broke a string on that one. Um, but that, that that went off good. And, and Conan is a really cool guy. I've done his show a couple times. We went back and did it again as the Del McCurry Band. 
and uh, he was just super nice to us and and he wanted to know about Dell's guitar. You know, he's a guitar player and kind of a rockabilly guy. And uh, Dell at the time had a signature uh, Martin D28. And uh, so Conan wanted to check that out. So we're sort of standing in the vestibule where all the elevator doors are at uh, 30 Rock. And, and uh, he gets a guitar and he's like strumming on it. He goes, you know, you get a guitar like this, you just want to go, <laughs> blue moon, a blue moon. <laughs> And he goes, no, 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 you guys play the music here. And uh, But we got some pictures of him jamming with us and stuff. It was pretty cool. And then years later, I was on a show in L.A. with uh, Ashley Monroe. And the uh, same thing, you know, you go first thing in the morning, sound check and everything, and then you tape at 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And uh, what his thing was, was that he, after his rehearsal for the show, his script rehearsal and everything, he would jam with his band for like 30 minutes. Now, that was his daily treat, you know, as he got to play with the band. And he had this beautiful, beat-up Stratocaster. And at the end of that show, I asked him, I said, man, what year is that Strat you're playing? He goes, 54, same year as Buddy Holly's. He said, my my production company bought that as a gift for me. I was like, man, nice. That's some gift. Yeah. I mean, I don't tell him what those things are worth these days. But anyway, it's kind of neat to interact with those guys through music, you know. Well... You know, like I say, Della quit once, the, quit the tour once, and, and uh, got it patched back together. But uh, to be honest with you, I think that um, it's probably the first time that Dell ever really received criticism from his fans, you know. This was a big tour, a big event, musical event. And, of course, Dell's been at it at that time for, he'd already been playing out there for 30 years, you know. So he had a lot of bluegrass fans that were coming to these concerts and just sort of seeing what it was all about. You know, Steve Earle told us early on, he's like, look, make sure that you realize that there's going to be a lot of people that don't get this collaboration. There's going to be my fans that aren't understanding why I'm playing bluegrass and not rocking out. And he says, and you're going to have a lot of fans that are wondering what the hell you're doing on stage with me. He said, but let's not worry about them. Worry about the people that get it. Let's play for them that are in the fence and, and get it. And, uh, and he was right, because it was kind of controversial in a way, because Steve was very different in his way of performing than Dell was, you know. Uh, and a lot of people know a little bit about this, but they all think that it's because Steve used profanity on stage or something that that, that just really irked Dell. But Dell couldn't really hear any of that stuff, you know. He didn't know what was going on on the side of the stage. And, um, and you know, a lot of F-bombs. When we played Merle Fest, we all bet, you know, how long is it going to take for Steve to drop an F-bomb at Merle Fest, you know, at this big festival? <laughs> it's the first thing out of his mouth, you know. Man, you guys, a bunch of tough <laughs> effing music fans out there sitting out there in this rain. He <laughs> just went into it. That's the first thing out of his mouth. And uh, But anyway, uh, I think Dell started getting criticism from his fans, like getting a letter or three or four and saying, you know, why are you on stage with a guy who does this? You know, and at the time also Steve, Steve's also, you know, we'd never been around an activist and Steve was an activist and he was really after, uh, he was part of a, um, at the time the movie uh, Dead Man Walking had come out, he had a song on there and he knew the guy that that movie was about and been pen pals with him. And so he was uh, in and out of our tour working with this group of people that were uh, victims of murder that were against the death penalty. I mean, a complicated thing to be an activist about and a t very difficult thing for anybody to attach themselves to. So when you, when you get, you know, you get this mix of people in there, uh, you're going to get some differing opinions out, out there about it, you know. But um, that, that was all kind of fresh and new to us was, you know, being around somebody who isn't actually an activist and stood for some things. We learned a lot about a lot of things from Steve. He's a very, very knowledgeable guy. And, um, and you know, that part was really, you know, came away with a lot of things having learned him from Steve about music and, you know, history. And he's a real history buff, very well-read guy. But those things are controversial in concert. You know, Dell's the kind of guy, he would never even touch that stuff. You know, it's just like, I'm here to entertain an audience, not, uh, you know, push my political views on anybody. Um, but, you know, Steve comes from a folk tradition of that, you know, which is part of music, is, is taking a stand on something and using the music to get in front of enough people, you know, to, to get that message out there. Like I said, I don't think it was anything that Steve did or said. It was just that, 
Dell got criticism from his longtime fans, and it didn't set well with him because he probably never had that kind of criticism before, you know. And I think it was really difficult for him to, you know, balance it out and say, well, I'm sorry you don't get it. But I think he had an allegiance to those people who had been with him for all those years. So I think uh, in the middle of the European tour, you know, we were going to supposed to go back to the States. And we're going to do a whole West Coast run and this and that. We had a whole other leg of the tour that we hadn't done. And uh, I think Dell just decided that it was too much, uh, too much commitment on his part. And he just wanted to do his own thing. And uh, so he decided that when we got back to the States that he was, that was going to be the end of it was the last dates in Europe and that would be it. And, and that's what happened. And then uh, Steve assembled a new band around him to finish out these other tour dates after Europe. But with Europe, you know, we had all the tickets were bought. You know, it was just a lot of the infrastructure was in place in our names. You know, it was just going to be so difficult for them to have to regroup everything. that It made sense for us to go to Europe and do that. And then when we got back, um, he was able to reassemble a band with Tim O'Brien and Daryl Scott. Dennis Crouch and uh, Casey Dreesen, pretty pretty dang good. Uh, and they were called the Bluegrass Dukes uh, after that. When you guys went back at it, did this help the the crowds get bigger for Dell shows? Oh yeah, yeah. This was like an amazing event musically, especially for music lovers. Out of that, we got another booking agent. We moved on to a guy named Bobby Cudd, who was uh, he booked us into. After that, we started playing every college. Uh, bar in the Deep South. We played every one of them. Oxford, Clemson, Athens. You know, we went to every big SEC town and played. And we just saw these crowds, you know, and we started playing outside of bluegrass festivals and just people showing up because of our, their familiarity with Steve Earle or their familiarity with uh, the record. And, and uh, you know, just did a, the, it really, it really did a lot. It, it it gets it doesn't get enough credit actually that album for launching uh, not only Steve's resurgence but the Del McCurry band you know getting outside of this, the sort of the regular bluegrass world which is a big deal you know it's hard to do yeah. well what was neat about it was uh, we presented it in that same way that uh, like I said it was in one microphone it was so authentic to people I think they just reacted that to that authenticity. Right off the bat, we weren't just some other bluegrass band, you know. Uh, we had the chops, but we had this guy, Del McCurry, who was just sort of the epitome of bluegrass singing and, and had these great songs and, you know, great band and everything. So it just, it all clicked together, you know. It's, we all had a great time down in the music part of it. Uh, up here in the management part of it, I think they had a lot of electricity going on up there that, you know, eventually affected things, but it didn't have anything to do with me. I just, you know, I just love playing the music and being around these people and and being in front of these crowds. It was just so much fun. You know, we closed with Copperhead Road and I had my bass plugged in direct. And so we would do the beginning of Copperhead Road, you know, he played it on the mandolin and I would turn the bass around and I would just hit it like a big kick drum or a big bass drum, you know. And then I would point at the audience and they would give me a clap, you know, and we had this whole thing going at the beginning of, it was so much fun, you know, and I never had an experience like that. I never played any rock bands or anything. So all of a sudden we're at the Vic in Chicago, you know, and packed and uh, everybody just totally into it. It was really, really cool. And we had, like I said, we had a great sound guy who was able to get the sound across to them, you know, which is hard to do on one microphone. One of the other fun things we did was, uh, a TV show called Sessions on West 54th Street, which is sort of uh, like an Austin City Limits type show that was based in uh, New York City. And it was taped at the old um, Columbia Studios right in New York on West 54th. And uh, in there was like uh, a swim tank where Esther Williams used to do her uh, movie shots. And they had you know, camera windows down in the tank or outside of the tank where they could film her swimming in this thing. Well, it was covered over, but that's one of the things that was filmed there. Sinatra recorded a bunch of records there. It was a recording studio and a television production place. And so the guy that directs this whole thing comes up to me and he says, what's this one mic thing about? 
And I said, well, it's pretty easy from your standpoint. I said, everything that's going to happen is going to happen in front of this microphone. I said, it doesn't matter if you're shooting from there, down here, or that camera over there. I said, it's all going to happen right here. I said, we're going to be fanned out, and we're going to come to this microphone. So no matter where you're shooting it, it's, you'll be in, you know, the action's going to be in the frame. He's like, okay, okay. You know, so we do our sound check and camera blocking and stuff. And it's a whole set of music. It's on uh, YouTube. You can see it. And it just came off really, really good. The sound was good in there. We could hear really good. And we were pretty loose because we'd been playing a lot. And I just remember all those union stagehands. They had nothing to do, you know. And they were sort of pissed on one hand, but on the other hand, they're getting paid for doing nothing because they weren't needed, you know. But it's one of those things where like, they would stack, they, like they'd tape two or three shows in a day. So they'd be there from the morning until the last one at night, you know. And But they couldn't leave. They had to make that whatever it is they make, 40, 15 hour. So I just remember like 15 guys just standing around, you know, watching. Steve did use me on some other records after that. And, I got to record on a few other things, other records that he made where he wanted upright. Roy Husky was his guy, but Roy Husky passed away in uh, 96. So I think it was 96, yeah. So, you know, uh, that's why he was using me on a few things. And then eventually when Dennis started playing with him, I'm sure Dennis played on a few things for him too, you know. Because yeah. a lot of times those guys will keep it in the family. You know, if you got somebody working for you, you're going you're gonna to get them to do your session work and this and that, you know.